Good morning, everyone. Um, we'll give another minute for a few more people to join in, and then I'll uh, turn the podium over to Dan to do some introductions for today's exciting program. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another remote cardiovascular medicine grand rounds. Uh, today will be day two of a very exciting program on innovation that is being hosted and uh, organized by Dan Jacoby. Uh, next week, we will resume our uh, more uh, normal type of programming with Charlene Day, um, who will deliver an exciting lecture on the uh, recently published guidelines for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, so with that, thank you for uh, joining us, and I will hand the podium over to uh, to Dan. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm going to stop my video as in the past, just to uh, make sure that um, there's no breakdown in the internet. Um, and I'll share uh, the slides to get us started. Welcome back, everybody. Very excited for day two of the Innovation Ground Round, uh, Grand Rounds series. This is sponsored by the Center for Healthcare Innovation and in the section Cardiovascular Medicine. Um, today, we'll be announcing the winners of last week's, frankly, totally amazing pitch competitions. Comple I think everybody was completely blown away. The feedback I received from people was so positive. Uh, about the incredible work that we saw. Um, and it was just it was just an amazing event. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed it. We'll announce the winners from that. And then we'll have two speakers for what I've titled overall a practical and existential guide to innovation. Um, and I'll announce those speakers of uh, Margaret Cartiera and Michael Stinger uh, individually when we get there. So let me shift to Dr. Velasquez. Dr. Velasquez, would you like to announce the winners for last week's pitch competition? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dan. And, and thanks to everyone uh, listening in and, and, and most importantly to our, uh, to our uh, pitch contributors. Uh, I have to say I was, uh, I was uh, blown away is a good, good term, but I was so very much impressed by the uh, depth and breadth of the ideas. Um, the thoughts about, uh, uh, frankly, I, uh, what, what is happening already within our Heart and Vascular Center and, and our section, and, uh, and the opportunities that these, uh, these ideas put forward uh, can take us uh, with regards to, um, to modifying and improving uh, how we approach uh, healthcare, uh, particularly for our patients uh, with cardiovascular diseases. So I was just, first of all, it's very hard to uh, identify among so many meritorious uh, um, uh, contributors, um, uh, uh, one or two individuals that uh, that we would like to uh, initiate some funding with. But I think uh, that's that's the job of these pitch fests. And then I think we, uh, all of the judges, I want to first thank all the judges for their contributions, their questions, their discussion, um, and uh, and uh, and also thank um, uh, the Center for Healthcare Innovation. And, and the job, uh, Josh uh, Gibson Memorial Fund uh, uh, for supporting these activities along with the, uh, the school and, and the health system. So with that, uh, Dan, I'd like you to go to the next slide and announce um, that uh, our uh, first uh, uh, prize winner was uh, Dr. Moran Sadegi, uh, who, uh, who will receive $5,000. And our second uh, prize winner uh, was uh, uh, Mori Mikado. Now uh, I would uh, highlight that these were uh, I think uh, 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 pretty unanimous uh, dis uh, um, decisions, um, uh, but there were uh, there was a lot of, uh, of uh, back and forth about the value of many of the of the uh, contributors, um, and we hope that this uh, uh, process uh, only initiates further inquiry in how we can uh, move um, the ideas forward 
and how we can uh, help in uh, with the uh, CHI in developing these ideas for further funding. So um, again, congratulations to Maron and, and Maury, but really to all of you. And I think you'll hear from Dan Jacoby, uh, who's going to lead our efforts uh, 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 on how to uh, move forward, uh, not only with our winners, but with uh, uh, our other contributors uh, in, in the near future. So with that, Dan, I'll stop and uh, take it, give it back to you. Thanks, Dr. Velasquez. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, congratulations to our winners. Uh, if, if we could, everybody would receive uh, equal prize, but winners there are, and these are the folks. Um, congratulations to everyone who participated. Um, let's move on to our next um, activity. I wanted to spend a minute, um, as I've done before when I've given uh, grand rounds at different locations, to talk about the Joshua Gibson Memorial Fund which is um, uh, partially sponsoring this event. Josh Gibson uh, was a really good friend of mine and of Dr. Singer's uh, when we were in medical school at Yale and actually I also went to residency with him where we, we co-founded an organization um, which we termed AIM, Advancing Idealism in Medicine, uh, which was an effort to combat uh, resident burnout and to allow uh, resident house staff an opportunity to give back and advance their ideals in medicine. Josh um, singularly lived these ideals. He was an amazing individual who traveled around the world, worked in refugee camps, uh, was always interested in what he could do to give back uh, and ultimately matched an infectious disease at Mount Sinai school of medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital to uh, hone his skills in treating infectious disease so that he could be a doctor to the world. Unfortunately, uh, he passed of sudden cardiac death during his fellowship. Um, it was an enormous loss to us all. Um, and uh, Dr. Singer um, later on, um, uh, as things evolved with his uh, innovation um, projects, um, was able to create a fund um, that he contributed to the Yale School of Medicine under the section of cardiovascular medicine for a study of um, cardiac disease and sudden cardiac death uh, in the otherwise healthy young, which um, has been used at the cardiovascular section to bring special individuals like Nick Papoutsakis, who you all will remember, um, and uh, get uh, several publications and participate in registries and, and national research projects um, that we're still working on till, till today. If Josh was here, um, I'm sure his heart would be warmed by the projects that he saw, um, would have seen last week, and by the lectures to come. And um, I'm sure he would be proud of, of what we're doing to try to remember his legacy. Um, uh, I would like to introduce, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. I, I think I had this reverse. I, I think the way that I had this organized, I apologize, was that, um, Margaret Cartier was going to be our first speaker. Um, Margaret um, is someone who I've been working with closely. She is uh, the uh, innovation director for Yale Center. For, she's the venture advisor for Sci Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale. And she is the innovation director for the Yale New Haven Center for Healthcare Innovation. Before all that, she received her PhD uh, with Mark Salzman on the analysis of the interaction and intracellular fate of nanoparticles in epithelial cells and application in oral delivery of PLGA nanoparticles encapsulating curcumin for treatment of cystic fibrosis. So no doubt uh, Margaret has many achievements in uh, science as well as in innovation. She has worked for a number of different organizations, um, perhaps um, uh, most importantly, she led Connecticut, for this purpose, she led Connecticut's Bioscience Innovation Fund, which is a $200 million 10-year fund focused on early stage bioscience and managed the state's regenerative medicine, which was set at $10 million of investment annually before she came to Yale. She's worked for another, a number of other industry um, organizations um, and has uh, just a, a wonderful way about her, uh, always open-minded, extremely organized. Um, and uh, wonderful to work with. Um, and I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Cartiera to speak to us about uh, practical um, uh, means of innovation at the Yale School of Medicine and Yale New Haven Health. For that very kind introduction, Dan. I'll share my screen. I've uh, assembled a few slides. Um, can you see this? Yes. 
Great. I've assembled a few slides to share information about two centers we have within our ecosystem that look to support Yale innovators. One of them is my home center, which is the Yale Center for Biomedical Innovation and Technology. And the other is Yale New Haven Health Center for Healthcare Innovation, which is sponsoring this event. The two different centers um, work at slightly different stages of innovation, and I thought it would be helpful for everybody to hear a little bit about both of them and how we work with innovators at Yale to support your work um, in the innovation space. Uh, so the first, which is CBIT, um, we are all very familiar with acronyms here on campus. So the Center for Biomedical Innovation Technology really looks to um, catalyze biomedical innovation and make so novel solutions a reality here on campus. When the center was established about seven years ago by Dr. Peter Shulam and um, Dr. Mark Saltzman, they realized that there was a gap on campus um, that if you were working on innovation, it was difficult to access people who had um, a practical understanding of how to translate technologies um, and have that industry perspective in terms of taking an innovation um, and having somebody to provide that valuable guidance to get you from point A to point B. Working in an academic environment, we have phenomenal people surrounding us all, all the time, but how do you talk to people very readily in terms of helping you along that journey? So they assembled CBIT and uh, within our team, we have several repeat entrepreneurs who have worked in industry, started companies of their own. Um, many of us are engineers or clinicians and um, have started companies of our own or worked in investments. And so we look to bring that knowledge and help support you um, on your journey of innovation. And the way that we really look to impact is to inspire you all to work with one another, um, particularly um, creating cross-functional teams so that you can take your innovation forward. Um, and obviously to direct clinical outcomes and uh, the patient provider interaction. So we find that in, in working with clinicians in particular, you all already understand the clinical need and the so solutions that are necessary to um, in response to that need. As we heard with our pitch competition last week, um, phenomenal ideas, um, needs identified very um, readily. And, and so it's really just um, then taking those solutions and taking them along that path um, and transit, translating them effectively. So um, we're really looking to partner and we don't take an ex equity stake. We really are here to provide that guidance um, to accelerate the faculty translation and also help with student venture creation. Um, we're we're looking to increase the number of value technologies that reach patients and providers. And we're looking to really complement the existing knowledge that um, our, our different clinicians and scientists already have on campus. So really trying to provide that perspective of market opportunity, the voice of customer, perhaps asking questions around competitive landscaping, business models, and thinking through um, what are resources for funding, as well as potential industry partnerships as you move along um, toward you know, exit and other opportunities. When working with students, we often find that they also do come to us uh, for career counseling. The approach that we take at CBIT is um, one that has been termed um, the Gates approach. So it's guidance and impact tracking system that's been published on. And it really is working in four different tracks. So um, we found that some innovators really take the technology, so the solution to whatever the need is and move it forward along the seven stages of innovation. But uh, it's really important to look at all four tracks, which include the clinical, the regulatory, the technology, as well as the business and the market approach and move them along those four stages um, from clinical need, idea, proof of concept, all the way through the standard of care. And we're looking to um, work with each of the innovators on campus in thinking through, you know, the guiding principles, you know, planning and tracking the different milestones and understanding how do we deliver upon uh, them at the different phases, um, making sure that we're thinking through, you know, what what will be sort of um, that, that project, that portfolio as time evolves and then analyzing best practices as we work as a team over time. So what can we offer you 
um, and very simply uh, expert mentorship. So we're looking to make things easier for you as you move forward and give you bite-sized milestones that we can uh, work together on. And so oftentimes it's a conversation and um, understanding where you are currently and then uh, where you need to go next. So we're not looking to change your vision, but help you along with whatever your vision is for your particular technology, or maybe think through that vision um, or help you pick Pivot on what the next step might be. So we do provide that tailored guidance. And sometimes it's really just understanding the nomenclature. So we have incredibly bright people on campus and um, they're capable of many, many things. Um, but sometimes working within innovation is just a, a new language in a new world. So helping to decipher that. We do look to make impactful connections. So through our network, we can help point you to valuable resources, whether they are on campus or within our network. Um, and oftentimes it's helping to assemble to, uh, teams. So we may have a clinician who's identified um, a need and also a potential solution, but they may not know how to build it. And so we work very closely with a lot of different centers on, on campus and the different groups. So uh, the Center for Engineering Innovation and Design, um, uh, the Office of Cooperative Research. And so we may be able to help um, point you toward additional resources or people who may be able to help you take that idea forward. And for teams who don't have that clinical expert, uh, we oftentimes um, help and encourage them to get that voice of customer or that clinical insight on what they're working on. So we also get engineers uh, walking through our doors or business folks coming to CBIT for uh, mentorship. And so we also encourage them to work with clinicians and folks like yourselves. In the end, we really want to empower you so that you can um, move along and make progress on each of your ideas and provide you with structured as well as unstructured learning. And so it is this mentorship. We also do offer coursework, formal coursework. So we have a management um, and medical school. So it's cross-listed MD, MGT, 657, creating healthcare ventures class. We've also offered other classes in software design as well as um, medical device design on campus. Um, and, and we also have other events on campus to provide that um, formal learning for individuals. In my role at Sci City, I also um, partner with a lot of individuals on campus to provide, our, provide insight for students and structure learning there. So our goal is really to connect you with innovators, with resources so that you can move along. So what have we done? We've mentored over 300 individual projects um, and we have supported each of them on their path to raise additional funding. So whether that's grant funding or venture funding so their projects can um, move forward onto the next phases. We lead an annual healthcare hackathon every year. So for the last seven years, and we'll be going into year eight in January. And with each of those events, they're phenomenal events. It's a weekend event with over 250 participants. We welcome each of you to those events. Um, and it's a great, um, uh, opportunity for you to connect with other individuals who are like-minded. And we do welcome students as well as clinicians, scientists, industry groups. Um, so half of our participants are from the Yale community and the other half are from outside the Yale community. We have a partnership at CBIT with Medtronic that's really focused around education and helping Medtronic to understand how we work as a health system um, and how we use their tools to impact patient health and they in turn learn um, and we in turn learn more about how they create their tools. So it's really a two-way partnership so that we can understand one another and, and um, improve the way that we provide each of our services. CBET has partnered with Yale New Haven Health in the last four years and I'll tell you a little bit more about the impact of that partnership. Um, and we've established the Center for Healthcare Innovation um, with that leadership team. And we've also um, been a thought leader in terms of how we move innovation forward. So how do you connect? How do you get a hold of us? Um, please visit our website. 
Um, and also please feel free to reach out to any of our um, members. So each of us, as you can see um, with a slight um, bit of description below each of our names, um, has experience, extensive experience in industry. Some of you may already know Dr. David Rosenthal, who's an um, assistant professor here on campus and also has a role at the VA, um, also has great experience in health IT. Chris Luce is a co-founder and CSO of uh, several companies, and Mike Dempsey has a role um, at CIMIT, which is an organization in the Boston area and has um, founded several different companies, and you all know about me. Um, we also invite you to um, participate in our annual healthcare hackathon this year, which is January 22nd to the 24th and really focus on big data and real world evidence. So uh, to transition a little bit uh, for, from CBIT, which is really focused on ideation and taking it from the early stages of innovation to the Center for Healthcare Innovation at the health system. Um, the, the center at the health system is really focused, I would say, at the next stages of innovation and supporting um, those ideas that are really already moving along. So many of the ideas that were already pre presented at the pitch event are, are those kinds of ideas that are already percolating and um, have their feet under themselves. And at the health system, we really are looking to create um, that entrepreneurial ecosystem and advance those ideas. And it really is within our mission to support innovation. Um, and, and it's within our vision, vision mission, and value system um, innovating and excelling in the patient care, teaching research and service that we provide to our communities. So it makes sense for us to set up our own Center for Healthcare Innovation. And we did that at the beginning of um, 2019. So the Center for Healthcare uh, Innovation is really a new organization. And it's a union between um, the health system and um, the, the university to really leverage the assets that we have uh, in creating, identifying and fostering and scaling health innovations and make us, making us a key site uh, for, for clinical care and leading research. We have a committee, a governing group that really helps forge uh, the path for us and it's comprised of uh, senior leadership at the health system, as well as two representatives from the university, which include the vice provost, as well as a representative, um, another representative from the university, Tim Pavlis. Recently, we've expanded our, our committee to include several clinicians. Um, so you'll see that Dan Jacoby, Harlan Kremholtz, Max Lorenz, and Lisa Latanza have joined our group to provide that clinical voice in different areas and we're really excited to have them on board. Our conversations with the committee have been really rich in terms of clinical impact and also um, moving us really forward on innovation and how we could be more strategic. So what do we do at uh, CHI and really what it what does our portfolio look like and how do we look to impact? So there's three areas of focus. First and foremost, it's culture building and supporting events like this and supporting innovators like you. Uh, we do make direct investments. And so if they are within our strategic focus and at the right stage, uh, we would um, engage the opportunity at taking them forward um, and providing some support, whether it's a, a direct cash investment or through resources that we might have at the health system. So we partner in direct investments with internal collaborators as well as external groups. So those are formal companies and I'll have a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we've also chosen to make direct investments in two select venture funds. So one is here within our ecosystem in New Haven and the other is a venture fund that is really focused on um, health systems and the the reason for that is really education so that we as a health system can understand how healthcare is changing over time and we can be at the forefront of that so we're looking to build our innovation culture across the health system and within the community and so we participate um, in different community events and try to support them. And we've also held uh, health tech forums and look to do that going forward. So we had our annual, uh, our, our inaugural health tech forum last year, and we'd love to continue that as, um, as time progresses. 
So innovation, in our opinion, is a rig rigorous process and really should be data driven. And I think all of you can appreciate that where, you know, there really needs to be evidence for moving something forward. And in particular, there need to be clinical champions, um, especially when we're thinking about something for integration within a health system, uh, includes a lot of diligence. And we really look to move ideas forward to a pilot and then potential scaling across the health system. So here's a look at what our work workflow is uh, within our team. So we really take any opportunity that might be coming in through the pipeline. We do a bit of diligence uh, and, and look at what this opportunity might provide to the system, if it's within our mission, within our strategic focus for the year, for the next couple of years. Uh, we, we look at those focus areas, dig into the diligence. Uh, we have a list of criteria in terms of team, novelty, um, business plan, et cetera. And then if it passes each of these stop gates, then we might move on to either pilot or looking at other opportunities in terms of uh, potential collaboration or partnering. And if it is an internal collaborator, either within the health system or the university, if there's a potential for a spin out and then um, maybe uh, scaling across the health system, depending if we sort of moved past that pilot phase. The sectors that we focus on um, are, you know, in the digital health, the data um, sector. We are looking to leverage a lot of the assets that we have within our health system. Um, the diagnostic space, uh, medical devices, so med tech, as well as care delivery, finance, and management. So anything within the operations space. So what does this mean and how can we partner with you? Um, so it really depends on the stage that you were at or who we're talking to. So whether they're internal innovators, uh, university collaborators or student teams and they're at the idea uh, or prototype stage, um, this is just you know, a few of the examples that might uh, be ways that we could work together. So we help support by providing a needs assessment, a better understanding of what the standard of care might be, uh, workflows. So very often, uh, oftentimes we find that uh, different groups may not understand how this technology might be implemented with a, within a healthcare system or within a, a clinical workflow. We also can provide perspective in terms of payer information or financials. When it comes to working with early stage companies or slightly later stage companies that might be at that series B, again, we can provide voice of customer. There could be a co-development opportunity, data access, and uh, an opportunity for pilot and feedback. And as we move uh, later in the development timeline with the growth stage companies, um, very often we could partner for a clinical IR, IR uh, IRB, so clinical evaluation, uh, thought leadership with the phenomenal um, people we have working here within um, our community, as well as scaling and adoption or a formal vendor relationship. So we're here to help. We want to support you. Please connect with us. Uh, there's some contact information. We do have a website. We're really looking to help demystify innovation and innovation within the healthcare system and develop your venture and support inside out innovations and help provide um, the information that you need to move uh, opportunities forward. I'll pause here for any questions. Um, one thing we can do is you can put your question in the chat bar and then uh, after also after Dr. Singer's talk, we can take questions for both speakers, or if you have a question you'd like to ask right now, uh, we, I'll leave it open for uh, a, a, cu a couple of uh, or a minute or so and see if anybody has any questions for right now. Um, one question I have for you, um, Margaret, is having having worked through um, one or two or, or now three of these innovation cycles, one for uh, that I'm working through now with data, another one with di uh, and then two with diagnostics. Um, if I have a question from the perspective of a, of a uh, clinician, if I see an opportunity for a diagnostic, um, uh, an improved diagnostic, but don't have the technological expertise to develop it, is this the kind of thing that I could contact um, the CHI or CBIT about and be and, and have help being connected with, say, someone in biomedical engineering or, or some other group that would potentially help me develop my solution? Yeah, so we can definitely help connect you with people 
um, on campus or outside of campus that we may know of. Um, as a first step, we would probably um, have a conversation, understand where you are with the technology and what your needs might be. Um, but that's something that we very often do. So then we would um, take a look at who we might already be working with or somebody who might, might have approached us with an interest in working on a project. And then, um, Sort of the next step would be reaching out to the network that we have um, on campus to see uh, who who you be, you would be able to connect with in building that initial prototype or taking that forward. So we usually start with our on campus resources and then work from there. But definitely, uh, very often uh, building teams is is um, a request that we get. Uh, and uh, we we do our best to connect different individuals on campus to make that um, make that move forward. You know, to me, that's incredibly important, particularly from the um, clinician side, because it's we're very busy and you get in the, in the environment, you see a lot of opportunities for improvement and innovation, but don't always either have the skill set or the time to to move that opportunity forward. So being able to reach out to, to CBIT or CHI to, to kind of figure out if your if your idea or insight has legs, or the steps that you need to take to figure that out and how to build that team, it will be is a huge resource, I think. Yes, absolutely. I think it also depends what your need is at the time. So I, we have phenomenal students on campus who help, could help support and a great engineering department. And so sometimes it's really understanding what that first prototype will look like and then iterating on it. Other individuals really want to take it to that next level and you know being connected with an industry contact so maybe they've already gone through that prototyping phase and need to be connected with an industry group and we could do that as well so as as i mentioned really it's understanding where you are and what your needs are for that next step and then uh thinking through what resources we can connect you to to get there thanks margaret i'm gonna um uh, I'd like other people, if they have questions, just write them in the chat if possible. I want to allow Dr. Singer to go ahead and, and get um, get his um, uh, his talk going. Um, I'll, I'll just spend a second introducing Dr. Singer. Um, and by way of disclosure, uh, Mike's been one of my best friends uh, since we first met, I, I think the year before uh, uh, medical school started and we both went to Yale undergrad, although we didn't know each other at that time. Um, Mike is a, is a phenomenal guy. Uh, he graduated from Yale College in 1995 and in 2002 from the Yale MD PhD program where he did his um, PhD in neuroscience science. Um, he remains closely connected to Yale actually volunteering as an advisor to Yale based entrepreneurs so um, you do have access uh, to Mike. Um, since completing his ophthalmology residency at Harvard, uh, he's founded three companies in biotech and health services sectors. I think he's going to speak to us a little bit about them. The latest is called Cartesian Therapeutics, where he serves as a chief scientific officer. He also serves as the director at one public company, three startups at the Boston Museum of Science, and has been named as an inventor on over 100 patents worldwide. Um, by way of, of, of anecdote, I'll tell you that, um, and I, Mike, I don't know if you want to plug your ears for this, but Mike is probably the smartest person I know. He, um, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, he's fluent in a number of different languages that he's picked up along the way. Um, but, um, and I was always the guitar player in medical school, but uh, when, when Mike met his, his current wife uh, and his only wife, Baha, um, he, um, he fell in love and, and my wife and I showed up at his, at his dorm room apartment in, in Boston. And he pulled out a guitar, which he had taught himself to play and sang us a song uh, that he had written I believe it was in Farsi, which he had learned how to speak. Um, and my wife started crying halfway through the song. It was so beautiful. Uh, he's just a man of multiple talents. And uh, I can't thank you enough, Mike, for taking your time to speak to us today. Well, thank you, Dan. Can everybody see my screen and hear my voice? Yes, Dan? Anyone? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. To provide you an update on that song I wrote for my wife. She she told me my Farsi is terrible. <laughs> so, <laughs> it sounded thanks, good to me. <laughs> thanks very much for having me. Um, I, Margaret has talked to you all about the means uh, that Yale can provide to build your startup, and I think all that I can add today is an extra dose of motivation on how to give your idea a fighting chance.
And paradoxically, I think I'll do that by uh, highlighting some of my failures along the way and some of the humble ways that we overcame them. Uh, so here are four companies that I've co-founded and here's a list of companies I, I currently invest in and advise. Um, so this, I'll start a story. Uh, after I left Yale, I was forced to leave Yale by the ophthalmology chairman. He told me he'd only write a letter of recommendation for me if I left. I still don't know what that means. But uh, I went into residency expecting to come out with a, a career in academic medicine and instead had, had something very different happen. I got a business partner, Marat Kaleolu, and I met my wife, Baha. Now, Marat and I uh, realized pretty quickly we were not chief resident material. We were constantly scheming on how to invent things and start little companies. And so when we graduated, that's what we decided to do. Here on the right, you can see my in-laws at my graduation and that kind of um, empty and concerned look on my father-in-law's face is because his daughter had just married an unemployed doctor who still lived in a college dorm. <laughs> so um, we, uh, we first launched a company called Proviva and this was an epic failure. Uh, the, a judge at an MIT business plan competition told us it was probably the worst company name he had ever heard. And the idea was this, that we could use cellular technology to monitor a patient's use of rescue albuterol as a way to predict asthma exacerbations and intervene as the exacerbations were getting worse, for example, with more inhaled steroids or oral steroids. So uh, we, we, we had the idea, you can see here that we tinkered with it by actually building uh, an inhaler coupled to a cellular transmitter, but we never really delivered on that idea. And Reasons were, I think, that we failed to speak with customers, for example, healthcare payers, and we failed to recruit an experienced leader because the first time you really do need someone who's been around the block to help you out. So the outcome here was that a, a patent I had received for this um, ended up licensed to a third party by the hospital. And to this day, I get $50 per month in royalties, but that's about it. So uh, fortunately that, that um, fiasco was while we were still in residency and uh, getting a, a bit of a paycheck. Um, when, we, when we got out, we immediately started a company called Health Honors. And the idea behind this company was that we would use principles of intermittent reward, the psychology of B.F. Skinner to make Taking a pay, uh, to make it uh, taking taking one's medicine on time as appealing and fun and memorable as going to a slot machine in Las Vegas. And uh, with that image in mind, that's what we did initially. We actually bought handheld electronic slot machines, tore them apart, connect them with Timex watches and other parts, and build a slot machine that would let it would turn on when it was time to take your medicine, alert you. And when you opened up the container and took your pill, uh, your slot machine would turn on and give you a spin. You'd find out how many points you won. And at the end of the month, we would hand out gift cards to people. So this was obviously very clunky and difficult to administer. So we had another idea that we come up with a pharmacy bottle. And because we wanted to make sure that patients actually had the bottle in their hand when they were earning their points, uh, we kind of built a Roman cipher that let people dial into a 1-800 number, uh, rotate the top in a way that the system instructed, and then enter a secret code and find out how many points they had won. Now, an, an important distinction from Las Vegas is that in Las Vegas, the slot machines are random, but we were actually developing sophisticated computer algorithms that were designed to improve patient medication adherence as much as possible while minimizing the budget that we had to spend on incentives. So. As we did that, we, we knew we needed to get some data. And because we had no titles, institutions, or money, uh, we, we actually went wandering the streets of Central Square in Cambridge, Mass, and ended up persuading the YMCA to let us hand out these nifty little products to people. Um, and we, of course, we only put candy in them. And we ran a, effectively a marketing crossover trial. And we saw that even when we were just distributing candy, that these kinds of rewards did motivate people. 
Uh, there were significant improvements in some people's adherence. And bear in mind that um, some patients had high adherence to begin with, so there wasn't much room for improvement. With that data in hand, we were able to persuade a retail pharmacy to try this system out using statins. And here you can see um, on the right that a, a baseline um, prior, prior, to, um, prior to starting the system, there was 27% non-adherence, meaning that patients only remembered about 73% of their doses. And there's a little bit of a typo there. Uh, by using the system, however, over the ensuing four months, we were actually able to uh, achieve 99% adherence. And we verified this with pill counts and um, verifying the dates that patients refilled their medicine. So we thought this is awesome. We're gonna be able to sell this to pharmacies, pharmaceutical companies, healthcare payers, and so forth. And the two of us just couldn't make a sale. We couldn't even persuade anybody to invest in us. This time, we, uh, we were lucky. So we met a CEO, John Sheehan, here in Boston. He had already built and sold a couple of healthcare companies um, and was a terrific salesman. He even put some of his own money into our company. And over the next couple of years, uh, with John's help, we were able to sell um, what had evolved into a cloud-based, app-based solution. No more bottles or games, uh, physical games. We were able to sell that app-based solution based on our algorithms to uh, pharmacies, healthcare payers, major employers. And also, we, we, um, we got a, a fairly large contract to help AstraZeneca with launching Symbacorp. And we knew something about inhalers already. So we were able to make a pretty persuasive pitch to them. Um, by 2009, we had a modest little office in a suburb of Boston. We had 11 employees and a disease management company called Healthways, now called Tivity, came along and said, um, we'd like you to become part of Healthways. Every employee at that time was a shareholder. Um, everybody kept their job. Everybody did quite well. And um, that's... Uh, Health Honors Today was integrated into their book of business. It's just a tiny little service as part of many other things that they offer. So the next thing we went on to do was a company called Topokine. And we actually went back to something that had happened to us in our final year um, at Mass Eye and Ear. I was on the glaucoma service one day when people were kind of gathering around an interesting patient. And the patient looked like, um, looked like this here. The patient um, was special because most patients use glaucoma eye drops on both eyes when they have glaucoma. This patient was only using it on her left eye. And you can see that th this profound asymmetry developed. That's because the eye is normally surrounded by a large cushion of orbital fat. And uh, the fat, it turns out, was shrinking. So I saw this and immediately thought, hey, can we take this take this active ingredient and turn it into a skin product that you rub on your skin and shrink fat locally. And um, I, I put together and talked to the uh, folks there in the tech transfer and we got a patent application filed within one week. So uh, that was a question. Can we make a product that actually does this not as an eye drop, but as a dermatologic product? And um, so the first thing I did was go to the sample closet and get a whole bunch of samples of this drug. Um, I got somebody to run a, an ultrasound on my abdomen. And then I spent the next month rubbing this product on my abdomen uh, every day. And then I went back and had another ultrasound done. And that was an epic failure, it just didn't work. Um, the next thing we did was get a contract laboratory uh, to test this on genetically obese mice. And we were a little smart, smarter now. We got the pure active ingredient and we formulated it with um, proper dermal excipients, and we still weren't able to get anything. So we thought, well, maybe th this, this active ingredient is an amide, it's a prodrug, and that amide has to be hydrolyzed. Maybe it's not getting hydrolyzed. It, maybe it gets hydrolyzed in the eye, but it's not getting hydrolyzed on the skin. And we knew that esters are effectively hydrolyzed on the surface of the skin. So we, ch we chose an ester analog again and tried again sent it off to a contract lab. And when the slides came back, uh, we sat down in Murat's kitchen with his wife's old microscope. And um, you can see, this is exactly what we saw. The placebo mice uh, here on the left had very thick 
subcutaneous fat, very large adipocytes. And the mice that we had treated with our active ingredient, the adipocytes were much fewer and, and much smaller. We, we um, repeated this experiment on pigs and you can see the same thing happened there. So at that point, we were really excited. Now, we, if we told some of our old uh, classmates from residency and faculty members we knew what we were doing, they all kind of thought we were quacks. And this is, guys, this is silly, stupid stuff. This isn't science. Well, the, the truth is we, we did do a lot of science. We came up with new ways to determine the drug concentrations in skin and in subcutaneous fat. We also sampled drug concentrations in blood. And we saw that um, very, very interestingly, the, the active ingredient was preferentially accumulating in fat because it was very lipophilic, but because it was rapidly metabolized by the liver, anytime it seeped into the systemic circulation, it was rapidly eliminated. This created an ideal situation where the drug would act locally, but was actually quite safe from a systemic standpoint. We also elucidated the pharmacology of this agent, which had not been understood before. Now, we, it was known that prostaglandins like this engage a G-protein coupled receptor, but no one knew how they reduce fat. We figured out that through a calmodulin dependent pathway, uh, the, these drugs were actually activating AMP activated protein kinase, which is a kind of master regulator of um, adipocyte behavior. Uh, and so here on the right, you can see this is a control of skin. And then um, here, this is, we're actually staining for activated AMPK and, and you can see that that's what was happening. So um, great, we've got a product that looks like it shrinks subcutaneous fat. What are we going to do with it? And the, our immediate thought was, let's use it to shrink people's bellies. Um, the problem with that is when we, we, we learned by running a bunch of ultrasound, I'm sorry, CT scans, including on ourselves, that belly fat moves around um, when, when, when you breathe the axial thickness of the belly fat, uh, I'm sorry, the transverse thickness of the belly fat actually shrinks. And there's a lot of belly fat to reduce on the average person. So the drug would have to be incredibly effective to give you a measurable change. So that was a stupid idea that Marat and I had. I should say that I had. Um, fortunately, we had an advisor to help us out. So John Lamatino's former president of Pfizer and said, why don't you use this product where, where the idea started on the eye? Um, and here you can see a patient who's got lower eyelid fat prolapse. Um, she's not tired. These are not bags. Um, this is fat that's prolapsed forward. And she, look, she looks very tired and sad. Um, but you can see how much better she looks after she had eyelid surgery. So this is a real a real social disability for people affected by this condition and it meant something to us. And we were two ophthalmologists, so we were suited to work on it. Um, we had to develop a clinical outcome measure because no, none existed. And so we developed and validated the clinical rating scale. And then when we ran a um, randomized controlled trial that was double blind and placebo controlled, um, eyelids were rated by the patient and the clinician independently. We hit all of our endpoints, statistically significant. Here are some before and after photos. Now you would, you would think that it would be easy to sell this with this kind of data. But in fact, it took us a whole nother year to find a partner, which um, not surprisingly ended up being Botox maker Allergan. And um, I put the Yale symbol here because as, as Dan alluded to, by the time we sold the company to Allergan, Yale was a, a shareholder in the company and was able to benefit financially. If you have a startup um, and are interested in finding out how you can contribute stock to Yale and maybe have a, uh, some tax benefits, please, please talk to me. I'm trying to encourage more founders and entrepreneurs to do that. So from 2016 to the present now, Marat right here um, and I have been running Cartesian. We're a cell therapy company and what differentiates us is that we use mRNA engineering. The reason is permanently modified DNA modified cells can divide and proliferate uncontrollably after you administer them to the patient. So there's no way to control pharmacokinetics or the duration of, of um, activity effectively. With mRNA, there is a defined half-life. We can characterize that, control the pharmacokinetics, 
And as a result of that control safety, we can redose the cells that we make um, as necessary to get a sustained effect. We have three programs in the clinic right now in three different therapeutic areas, uh, ARDS, and the first CAR T cells from myasthenia gravis, um, Descartes 8, I'll tell you about that in a moment, and the first CAR T cells for a frontline cancer, um, which is Descartes 11. So just a little snippet of um, data, no one else has seen this um, really, except some company advisors. So you probably know that myasthenia gravis is a paralyzing neuromuscular disease. It's caused by autoantibodies that are directed against the neuromuscular junction. And with Descartes 8, we have a CAR T cell that's extremely effective at blocking the production of these autoantibodies by attacking the long-lived plasma cells that produce them. You can see that here. So um, I just show you some, some initial data. We've only treated two patients and both of the patients look the same. But over a period of several months, first we gave a, a, a very low dose and, and watched to make sure that it was safe. The patient showed what looked like a clinical response on the most commonly used clinical um, status scale and then, and then reverted to their prior state, which they had had, had, had for several years um, and were very steroid dependent. Uh, and then we increased the dose and, and, and so on. And the patient showed what looked like another dramatic um, improvement. I just saw the got data this morning, and I can tell you that this pattern is continuing. This patient who has been steroid dependent for many years and in a wheelchair is, is um, now standing up a bit, and the, the patient's uh, steroids are being tapered. So that's where we are today. Stay tuned on that. Um, to get to a couple of conceptual points, um, give your idea a fighting chance. So you all know you can't eat an apple seed, you can't eat a seedling. And when you go to investors, customers, potential partners, you're asking them to believe that your idea is gonna yield apples. So um, we, you know, we heard from Margaret all the amazing work that, that different parts of Yale are doing and, and technology licensing offices in general are, have these extensive efforts, but many good ideas at universities are stuck here as an idea. And the, if there's one message I wanna to communicate today, it's, that it's within your power to move them here to a working example that is protected by a patent. And that's why I put the fence here, okay? So um, how can you do that? What, are, what, what would I say are the key things? Aim for a product that's proven to work. And I've just put some pictures here, of ragtag things that we do. They didn't always work. They were kind of silly, but anything you can do to move the ball forward. And you have Yale resources, um, a word that I love is bricolage. If you know that word, I, I learned it last year. It's a French word meaning putting together or putting something useful together uh, with the materials that you have available around you. So try that out. Don't be, um, don't be shy about asking for introductions to people you don't know, reaching out on LinkedIn and so on. And of course, you've got the, the benefit of Yale to help you. Do whatever it takes to achieve physical milestones, get real world data, um, reduce perspective risk, and something I, I always see uh, as a problem is figure out how you're gonna manufacture your product ahead of time. That is usually the, the, the critical problem that's gonna delay people's um, getting to market. So uh, when I talk to um, first time entrepreneurs, they're often very excited about forming their corporation, very excited. Sometimes I would even say fixated on getting venture capital funding, which by the way, is something I have never done. Never, never got a check from venture capital. Um, and of, of course, they're excited about getting patents. I, I just want to point out that these are means and not ends. The, the end is to make and sell a product that's going to help patients. And these are just tools to help you do that. Okay, so <clears throat> I just want to finish up with a little pep talk. Um, we, we're, you know, we, we're going through a dark period in our nation's history. And I, I'm, a, I'm a real optimist, though. Um, and I imagine most of you are as well. So as an innovator, I, I, you, you advance an audacious American ideal. And often the spirit of a country is captured in its money. So if you look back in Rome, um, 217 AD, here's the emperor declaring that he's a pious and venerable ruler. And not much changed over the next 2000 years or so. So it, 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 at the time of the American Revolution, 
in England and everywhere in Europe, practically, all the coins look like this. There was a bust of a ruler um, in, intentionally looking like a Roman emperor and declaring that the, 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 the country was ruled by this person by the grace of God. At that very moment, what did the founders of the United States decide to do? Here's one of the earliest coins that they designed. And they did something very bold and subversive. They replaced the king with an image of a mythical figure whose name was Liberty. And with the very limited space that they had on this coin to write a message, they wrote, Liberty, parent of science and industry. Think about that, six words to encapsulate the nation's mission. And they decided to talk about science and industry. And this is a key reminder even today and when you look at Amer modern American coins, the word liberty is still there and that's what it's referring to. This woman here is the same woman here as here. Um, it's a reminder that our system of government, our system of free enterprise and constitutional guarantees is, a, is the foundation for scientific and industrial achievement. So I really appreciate you listening. I'll, I'll leave you here with an image of one of my heroes and um, and a quote that he, he just provided a few months ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was a fabulous talk. Um, and, and together, uh, your talk and Margaret's talks uh, really provide us with the inspiration, uh, examples, and uh, practical tools uh, to help us move our innovative ideas forward. I'll open it up. We do have a couple of minutes for any questions, either in the chat or live. Um, I don't uh, necessarily have a question. I just had a, a comment. Uh, it's very interesting. I, I I don't go to Yale. I'm a University of Arizona student, but I snuck in here with permission. Uh, um, and um, I just I did research on uh, Cartesian, your your company, uh, for a project in one of my courses, and I just thought it was interesting that now I've met. Uh, even tangentially somebody who's uh, related to that. So uh, thank you for helping me get an A on that paper. <laughs> Send me an invitation on LinkedIn, please. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you, Logan. I think Jeff Bender raised his hand. I, I did. So thank you, Margaret and Michael. Uh, that was absolutely terrific. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, so you you might know, I know Margaret knows that, that in, in cardiovascular medicine, in this section, in this division, we have essentially the equivalent of a basic science department um, in the Cardiovascular Research Center. And you both were uh, trained in basic science. And, and I have a question about uh, how you recommend bringing basic discoveries forward. So, so Michael, your topokine story is that you started with a drug basically, and you worked out a mechanism. You eventually understood the mechanism. What most of us do is work on molecular mechanisms and pathways and make um, hopefully novel discoveries that are potentially druggable. There are, are potential drug targets, but we may not have designed those or thought of things that way. How can we bring those forward to um, anyone at, at the university and help us direct those into a potentially uh, marketable is not the word I want to use, but um, maybe a little bit more clinically therapeutic arena, eventually marketable. Margaret, would you like to go first? Um. In, in my experience, at least, um, so uh, in my training, in my scientific training, I'm from biomedical engineering, and I found that uh, a lot of the work that I've done has been collaborative. So in, in working with um, clinicians at, at the medical school, it's really uh, sort of a, a brainstorming event, you know, in, in having multiple people talking about what the potential is for a, a therapeutic or a technology and, and taking it down that path. That would be my suggestion. 
So I, I would add that if you've d discovered an, a new active compound um, based, on, based on identifying a new pathway, um, first of all, getting composition of matter protection patents on that is absolutely crucial and keep the structures secret, okay? You can talk about your data, but don't show the structures to anyone. Um, the, uh, uh, what I think is a mistake that I see sometimes is that in universities, they'll choose a candidate and try to push that particular molecule forward um, into a clinical program. But almost always the pharmaceutical industry wants to modify the chemical structure for, for industrially important reasons, for reasons of manufacturing, stability, and so forth. So um, what, where you can provide a bigger impact, I would leave the final steps of medicinal chemistry to an, a large industry partner, but where you can provide more impact and it's in a neglected area because it's not well funded in the typical academic environment is uh, run formal safety studies and show that the drug is, is not toxic, uh, characterize the pharmacokinetics and figure out a, a way to synthesize it or to produce it in a reliable way that can be scaled up. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Um, I have a question in the chat um, from Dr. Sudegi. Uh, congratulations again, Dr. Sudegi for winning the pitch competition. Um, he asked, uh, he notes that securing IP protection is a key step for a product to get to market. How do you approach this with the university that has a limited budget for this? I, I think the, core, the uh, subtext being, you know, um, it, it just, the OCR simply cannot uh, patent everything and people get turned down for ideas um, and, and can't move forward through that. So how do you, how do you deal with that, that funnel? Cut a deal with OCR and put some of your own money in. If you really believe in it, that's what you should do. I don't know if, how Margaret feels about that. I'd be interested to hear. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a good question. Um, I think that's great advice, Michael. Uh, I, I find that doing a lot of upfront homework in understanding the market opportunity is also really important um, in, in moving forward with that conversation with OCR. If I might offer a reflection, having watched from the sidelines as, as Dr. Singer has gone through, um, you know, the slides he, he showed today, um, there's a lot of, and people talk about sweat equity, there's a lot of uh, sort of blood, sweat and tears and, and frankly, putting your money where your mouth is in terms of your own willingness to, um, in Mike's case, and I apologize from speaking on a turn mic, but live frugally um, and focus on your um, ambitions and your vision. Um, and take your take your resources and and take the risk, um, and I think that um, you know part of that is believing in yourself and being willing to do that. It's easier to do it when you're young and have fewer responsibilities, but I don't I'm not sure there's any substitute for it at a certain point. Yeah, I'm really a patent is getting a patent is short money. If it's a big idea, you know, spending five or ten thousand dollars is is a good investment. Um, it's 9.03, um, and I just want to thank a special, really thank you to Dr. Velasquez uh, for really supporting um, this idea of having an Innovation Grand Round series um, and just being, being fully supportive in every way and, 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 and you know, providing resources and advice around putting this together. A real uh, thank you to the CHI team, Joe Bison at the hospital system. Uh, the CHI team, um, Walter, Sam, and Margaret, um, and special thank you to, to Mike Singer, um, uh, who um, came and offered us his, his wisdom and, and his story today, and to our judges, um, John Soderstrom, uh, Eric, Margaret, um, and Mike, and also to Dr. Um, Churchwell, who is incredibly supportive um, and promoting uh, innovation across the system and, and, and was to be a judge, but had a conflict with a very important obligation, so he couldn't, but I want to thank him uh, for, for his support of all this effort. Um, looking forward to the next round sometime in the future. Hopefully we can redo the, uh, do something more like this in the future. If everybody enjoyed it, please send me your feedback on things that could have gone better or ideas that you would like to have uh, going forward for these kinds of projects. I'm open to any discussions and any ideas that you may have. And I wish everybody a great week. Thank you.